It's good to see you today in the house of the Lord. Aren't you glad you belong to the family of God and we're Christians today? We're going to be uh, looking at Ephesians chapter 2 today, verses 11, 14 through 16. And we're going to read it to you. Listen very carefully or look on the wall and look at the scripture because there's some really key verses in there that I'm going to be touching on today. How this Jewish Gentile problem that we saw in the scripture, how Paul addresses it and speaks to it, and how it was really was the beginning of understanding the idea of equality among people. It's very interesting today, so I pray, I hope that you get what I'm trying to say. I, I said, Lord, please help me to explain it the best that I can to people to understand, because it's important. So this is Apostle Paul. And I also think of the uh, authority of Apostle Paul, where he could speak directly in behalf of God, if you look at the New Testament. So he addresses the problem there at the Ephesian church. Don't forget that you Gentiles, remember now a Gentile, as you know, is anyone who is a non-Jew. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be, used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. When in his own body on the cross, he broke down the walls of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. He made peace by creating in himself one new people from every race on earth. That's what Jesus set out to do. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility towards each other was put to death. You may be seated this morning. You know, as I speak here today, our country is struggling with the idea of equality. And I'm going to discuss all these issues that the way the world is going at. They're trying to do their best to settle the problem and not having much success. So I'm not going to do that because it's not my place as a pastor to do that. And not only that, those of you that are here today are very well aware of the stuff that's going on. We see it every day on the media where there's this struggling, struggle going on for equality in our country. However, the reason I'm addressing it in part today because the Bible, as always, points out the solution to inequality of any form. And I think that we Christians need to be reminded of this, that our wonderful scripture, the wonderful words of life, Christ, God, has covered every problem you'd ever want to face in this life. It is addressed or would be strongly implied in scripture. But as the, the country is struggling with this idea of equality, I want to remind the church that Christ, through the cross, through Christianity, changed things that, so that all men would become one in him. But what I'm sharing this morning, it does not just have only to do with the racial disparity that happens in some corners. But other areas of concern in our nation, you're going to be surprised. Some of you might have known this already. It will be a, a, a review. Others, it might be new to you today. But my very thought today is at the very least, there will be a greater appreciation for the Bible that we teach and preach from in the church of Jesus Christ. How much wisdom is in his word. But as we look at the problem with the situation between the Jews and the Gentiles, the Jewish problem was they eventually got to the place where they thought as the chosen people by God that they were the only ones that had a corner on 
God. That's where the problem became. And so we're going to look at that today. And I don't want to pick on the Jewish people today. There's so much anti-Semitism going on. But this is how the Bible addresses it. And I hope that we're going to see some thoughts come up into our minds, Lord, to fix what's going on. The world is struggling to settle these areas of inequality. And what's so sad as I look at it, I say to myself, if they'd only look to the Bible and the scripture, this situation between the races and other areas of inequality that we're going to touch today would be solved immediately if people followed what the Apostle Paul delivered in behalf of Jesus, that Christ broke the walls that separated Jew and Gentile and all people going forward. The solution is in the Bible. And it's sad when we see the world struggling and we sit there in our home saying, boy, if you just follow what the Word of God said, half the stuff, most of the stuff you're fighting over wouldn't even exist because those problems would not exist if we looked to the Word of God to see that he settled this issue a long time ago. But as I mentioned last Sunday, why is it that the world doesn't accept the Scripture? Some of them are not interested. Some of them are not ready yet. But the Bible said, and I read the Scripture last week where Paul said, that the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the eyes of many unbelievers and they can't see it. You ever talk to some of your relatives that just can't see it? Well, don't give up because they'll see it one of these days as you continue to pray. They can't see it, but we see it here today. So I pray that our faith and excitement for the Word of God is going to grow today. And so we're going to look at this situation that Paul addresses and you'll be amazed with how if the scripture was followed in our world, all this mess that we're facing today wouldn't even exist. So immediately our first thought is the Gentiles in the Old Testament were considered outsiders. They were called uncircumcised heathens. Living apart from Christ. They were living apart from the promises of God and the hope that God could offer them because they were excluded because of their race. And as we will look in another scripture here in a while, the Gentiles were not only racially discriminated, but were also discriminated in many other areas of their lives. And we'll get to that later. And I think it'll kind of amaze you to see how, again, a lot of these things that we're facing in our world today would be solved in what we used to call a quick second if people would just follow the word of God. Are you hearing me well today? <laughs> Thank you. I was been called out. And they said, when I put my head down, you can't hear me. I was kind of joking. I said, I might have to wear a neck brace to keep my chin up. I'm glad you can hear me loud and clear. And so what happened, Paul addressed it, that Christ had to abolish the law because the rules and regulations which were good, remember the Old Testament, the law was like a schoolmaster pointing people to Christ. Christ hadn't come yet. So the law was good. It made you understand your sin. But what happened was they got totally into the flesh and Christianity to the Jews back then became a performance thing. And that's why the Pharisees were very judgmental to unbelievers. Remember the story where the Pharisee and the poor man were praying in the temple and the Pharisee gets up there and says, you know, I'm not like this man. I pay my tithes and I do this thing and I'm not like this guy down here. And that poor Gentile was saying, have mercy towards me, God, I'm a sinner. And what does the Bible say? Who is the one that walked away justified? It wasn't the Pharisee. It was that humble sinner who said, have mercy to me, a sinner. It became a performance thing, which we call legalism. I've seen a little bit of legalism, too, even in the Protestant church. I hope you haven't, where people think, you know, I don't do this and I don't do that and he does this. 
you almost get into this kind of scorecard mentality where you're keeping check on, oh, I saw him walking outside of that theater. I saw her. That spirit gets there. When it becomes religion by form and just practice, and like I said in the scripture, the Jews were proud of their circumcision, but it only affected their external bodies. It didn't affect their hearts. And in the New Testament, it talks about the circumcision of the heart. Everything starts in the heart. So that was their problem that caused it. They thought they were the, let's use that word, elite. We're the privileged people. What started out as a good thing, the law of God, turned into a performance faith. And you know what's sad today? There are many people who call themselves Christians that are going to even evangelical church who have what we call religion without relationship. Outward circumcision, but not from the heart. And we want to make sure that doesn't happen to us because it's not only the Jews that were capable of going off key. Many within the body of Christ can do the same thing if we're not careful. It's not about performance. All have sinned. We all come short of God's glory. And that's the way it is. So it wasn't from the heart. And so they held it against the poor Gentiles. So Ephesians 2.11, we're going to read that scripture because I just said it. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to, be, used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their hearts, only their bodies, and not their hearts. We want to make sure that that is not us caught up in that mess today. Now, the second thought we have this morning, which is beautiful, it was Christ that brought down the walls of separation, which affected so much of life when you stop, not just racial situations, but other areas. Jesus, the law was good. I'm not condemning that. Without the law, we would have known that we have sinned. But it became a point of bondage. Christ ended the era of the law with its requirements. I call that God's progressive plan of redemption. Although if you study dispensational truth, you see how God judged in innocence, human government, the whole story till we got to the dispensation of grace. Christ ended the Old Testament of the law with all its requirements. We get a pure, clear picture of this. When we look at the temple in Jerusalem, which had literal walls, of separation. I think it was Herod who built that particular temple. He was an Edominian, a convert, but he carried the old legal system. Now, when you look at the temple, you can see a clear picture of how segregation was in place, even in the house of the Lord. It happened through ignorance. At the very front would be the Holy of Holies, the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant went. And I think about Cliff and I who are pastors and priests here. You're all priests, really. The only one that could go into that place once a year was the high priest on the Day of Atonement to offer sacrifice for the sins of Israel. I've got to stop here a moment because I think of all the pastors all over, the priests. He had bells on the bottom of his robe. So when you hear, heard the jingle bells, it wasn't Christmas. When you heard the bells, oh, the priest is still alive. Why did they have to hear those bells? Because if the sacrifice wasn't accepted for the people's sins, they were struck dead, and they had to pull them out by a rope. You want to be a high priest, Cliff? <laughs> Boy, we had to do that today. I said, did you repent of that sin? <laughs> I want to make sure before I go in there there's nothing happening bad because I'd want to come out alive. But that's just my little humorous thought about the high priesthood, what they were up against. But it was, say that it's up here. And say that communion table was the Ark of the Covenant, the most holy place. Only the high priest could go there. 
So even there, when we look at typology, that's a picture of how under the old covenant in Israel, they couldn't get near to God. But when Christ was crucified on the cross, what does it say? That the veil in that temple was rent from bottom to the top, top to bottom, which meant everyone had access to God. So that's just a side thought. But there's a lot of uh, typological studies that we look at this beautiful thing. And I even thought about that dead priest with the rope. Christ had to die for our sins. So there's typology there. There's, there's lessons you can learn in the Old Testament that come to pass in the New Testament. It's a beautiful study. The holy is of holy. So we can understand that. That's where God's presence is. Then came the court of the priests. The sick maybe to be right here. And then, for all you macho men, we'd be next. We'd be there with our cocky machismo sitting there. Oh, my man, right there in our little court. Because behind us were those lowly women. They were the ones that were behind the men. And at the very back of the church where the sound system were the Gentiles. You see that picture? That was in the house of worship. You, are you getting a picture how people were far from God and how all that division came in? Some of the practices that we got into today that got into this mess was even pictured in that temple. That's why we, I hope this doesn't get too deep here this morning, are called the temple of God, the habitation of the Lord. So that's what it was. And in the court of the Gentiles, they say that there were signs posted that warned the Gentiles in the back of the church there by Jim, don't you dare try to move up to the more important class of people because if you try to come up there, you would be killed. So do you get the picture today? This, this is just a picture of the temple that existed. It already segregated people into different classes. When I think of the poor women that were behind the men, I think of people, as teachers have said it for years, the person in history that raised up the level of women was Jesus Christ. He was the one that brought us up before. Women were viewed as inferior to men. The Gentiles, way in the back where Jim's at, and he's not one of those, by the way. He's part of the fellowship were the lowly Gentiles. And this is who Paul was speaking to in this passage. You were you, Before you were called outcasts. You were called foreigners. You were not part of the family of God. But now God has drawn you near. And I have a scripture coming up that's been around forever and a day. How... In one broad stroke, Paul reveals this huge truth in Galatians 3.28 NLT. Look at that and see what it says. And it's going to cover a whole lot of people, a whole lot of things we're dealing with today. And if the world would just follow this, we wouldn't be in this mess. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, Male or female, you are all one in Christ Jesus. Yeah. What we're really talking about here when Christ came with us, it was like a, a new humanity, the new way to do business in the economy of God. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. Are we having a problem with those areas today? Racially, Jew or Gentile, slave or free. Status, who you are, elite, outcasts, other names that are being bandied about, male or female, women fighting for their position, men trying to hold them back, they say. All these things Jesus dispensed with. This is really powerful. No longer Jew or Gentile. One race in Christ, the human race. So when you see me as a dark-skinned, brown man, 
that's just my color. But we're all part of one race. Can I hear an amen for that in this church? So they talk about identity politics and all that stuff. But I want to tell you today, when we see one another, we are all part of the family of God. I don't care what color we are. We should actually be color blind. We are one people in Jesus. And that's what he taught in his word. There's no longer Jew or Gentile. You are all one in Christ. No longer slave or free. I've got money. You have none. I have status. You have none. Class distinctions that the world puts. Different areas of rank and superiority. Jesus blew, Jesus blew that all away. I don't see none of that. You're all my family if you're saved. You were all created by me. So this class distinction should not separate us as people because in God's eyes, he doesn't care if you're a poor man or a rich man. You're part of his family. And we should follow his lead. Neither male or female. We're all equal in him. I've taught you before about, you know, why you should submit and all. We, Cliff has taught us that too. I taught you that was not just a hierarchy or the man has to be the boss. There's different roles that we have. The husband has a role to provide for everything that goes on. The wife is there to help him and assist him. But I, I tell you very obviously in my own family, there's a lot of times my wife is smarter than me, has a better idea, and I'm smart enough to back off and say, take over, Susan. I'll, get, I'll have us in a mess here if I don't listen to you. She's a helpmate. And that's how we look at these relationships. Yes, the man is supposed to lead, but remember, that's a role that God has given you. And when you accept that role, though, this is a different sermon now, Cliff. <laughs> when you accept that role, realize you're responsible for everything right. in that house. So if things go haywire, wives. Look at old Horace and say, well, you're the boss. <laughs> We lost the house and the car because of you. I just submitted to you to be your helper. A little humor once in a while. One race. Can we get it into our spirits? One people, irregardless if we're a lawyer or a blue-collar worker or whatever, we're one in Jesus. Neither male nor female equality. And can we see this today? This is what the Paul delivered to the church, which would solve the problems of our country if we would just follow this word. We are all one in Christ. Can you imagine what would come into our country and our world if we put this into action? It, we would solve it quick. It would be over because these problems would not exist if people followed the Bible. So when you have your Bible, I'm, part of my sermon today is still make you treasure that word of God that you have, the scripture that you have, because that's where life is. And so we're talking about the discrimination that happens. We're talking about how the Lord blew it all away. And so in light of what the world is going through right now and what they're facing and struggling with, what should be the response of the church? What can we, the church, do to fix this? My answer is the third point, let the church be the church. I was talking to Dave yesterday. I don't know if he remembers. I had a good time talking to him, by the way. And I was telling him one of my thoughts tomorrow is going to be, let the church be the church. You know, about five years ago, and I don't mean to judge, I heard about a major evangelical Christian community that when all this racist stuff started about five years ago, they were sending manuals to all their local churches how to deal with race relationships. And I said to myself, I thought that was Christianity 101. Why did I have to have a manual? The scripture, I'm sharing it with you today, straight from the word of God. We're all one. We respect us all as one. We're all even in the eyes of Christ. Why would we have to have a manual? Which makes me think, maybe we've got some work to do in parts of the body of Christ. Maybe we need to clean up our acts. 
to really show Jesus to the world. I have a lot of this thing with the world B. You know, Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, telling people about me in any conflict that were happening. Everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I first got that little nugget of truth from a beloved pastor friend of mine, Reuben Maccabetus, from down south, when he spoke at a youth camp that I was leading many, many years ago. He read the scripture, and I never forgot it. You receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. And so we immediately think, okay, I'm witnessing. I want to tell everybody about Jesus. Yes, we do that. But he pointed out, he says, the scripture says that you will be. You know, when you go to a court of law, you testify. You speak in behalf of another. I, can, I know that so-and-so was a good man. He didn't do this. I have proof. I, I'm testifying before the, you two today, judge, because I know that they're not guilty of the sin. You're testifying or speaking to someone. We do that in the gospel, too. We testify of Jesus. But in the court, in the economies of God, the testimony is us. Yes, we speak truth. But we got to live truth. And that's where we miss it. I can talk about it all day, but if I don't live it, it's just the amounts of a hill of beans. We are to be witnesses, not just say it. In the area of all this discrimination we're talking about, we don't just speak against it. I don't have to go out in the street with a placard. All I have to do is follow this word of God right here. But the important thought today is, we are to be. So if the church is that witness, not just with their mouth, but with their lives, we could help turn this country. I hate to bring up something they were saying 30 years ago, and I hope it's not true today, that the Sunday school hour, they said in America, was one of the most segregated hours in, a, in the country. It's sad. I heard that as a young pastor, and it made me so sad that we really had some growing up to do within the body of Christ. Maybe we haven't been living it the way we're supposed to. And I condemn nobody. But my heart aches when I see things that could be different if God's people would just really live the word of God. They say, too, it's easier to preach ten sermons than to live one. <laughs> Get that, Pastor Cliff? We can, we can spout them all by the dozens, boy, but to live it's another different horse right there to be witnesses. As we're thinking about being the witness, not just saying it. We talk about the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. That's a cool name, huh? The Beatitudes? Warren Worsby, I think, was the one that separated that word. The be attitudes, right? Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are they... It's spouting it, right? But the B attitudes, does our lives show that Sermon on the Mount? Are we being it? Not just spouting it. The B. So whenever you read the B attitudes, B slash attitudes. We want to be what we speak. Witnesses. To exemplify, and now I know we're imperfect people. But you know, even your friends that see your imperfection, when they know that most of all, generally speaking, you're on the right track, they can overlook your mess-ups because they know no one's perfect. But as we aspire to become more like Jesus, to show people the world, what the world needs to see in the church is Jesus. What did Jesus say? If I believe, be lifted up, I will draw men to me. And I often wonder, why is it such a hard thing to draw people to Jesus? Then I have to ask myself the question, are we the church lifting up Jesus? Are we pastors lifting up ourselves? 
Are we lifting up maybe our programs? Jesus doesn't care about that stuff. Now, I know it matters this side of heaven, but he cares more about you. And are you showing the world Jesus in your life? What the world needs is Jesus. And so, as I come to the close here in a second, why is God's plan for inequality the solution over man's attempts that don't work. Simple. Because it addresses the heart of people. I don't condemn the world because they have to put their signs. They have to march peacefully and show it. That's, that's their best effort they can make. But I want to tell you, and I've said it for years, you cannot legislate racism out of a person. You cannot legislate an elitist spirit out of a person with a law. Now, we have to do it in society to control the people. The problem is they don't get to the heart of the problem. The only th thing that will take racist or inequality of any sort out of your life is the presence of Christ in your life because as a man or a woman thinketh in their heart, so they are so simple. God, like the circumcision that was an outward expression and the Jews pride in it, but it didn't affect their hearts. All the efforts of this world, again, I'm not condemning it. That's their system. They don't know anybody. They're trying their best. I'm for them there too. But they're missing it by a country mile. Because you cannot legislate rules to change people's hearts. They'll still hate you no matter. I don't care if you say you shouldn't. but It'll still be there. The only one that can change your heart is Jesus Christ and his word as you continue to attend a Bible-based church that preaches the wonderful words of life, the truth of the gospel. And so, aren't we happy today to know that we have God's word? So when the world is all in the topsy-turvy and upside down and trying to fix this mess and they're not getting anywhere, we feel sad for them. But as Pastor Cliff said, our Christ, our God is our commander in chief. We're kingdom people. We're in the world but not of it. We love them. We work with them. But we know that God's plan is going to work. And even when we have our election, I know we all have our choices. And we're pinning a lot of our hopes on certain individuals. But remember at the end of the day, no man in this world can solve all the problems of this nation. Only Jesus. Sorry, world. Man's best can't do it. God's best, his son, can. Let's stand to our feet this morning. God bless you. Did you learn something today? I hope so. I prayed over the sermon. I says, I hope it'll at least make people love the word of God. And I know it's kind of review to some of you or reminder. Maybe it was new to some of you. But you can walk out here today and say, you know, we're on the right path. We haven't filled this church yet, but that's no problem. Jesus said narrow is the way anyway. But we are in the way of life, the way of truth, and we have Jesus Christ. And so as we looked at our lesson today, we saw three things. The Gentiles in the Old Testament were considered outsiders. Jesus brought down the walls that separated us in all these areas. And my final thought to me is this for you. You don't have to go outside and grab a sign and march all over the Lomita Boulevard with your little signs. If you want to do that, that's okay. But I say, let the church be the church. The Bible says we're the epistles of God written in our hearts, not on stone. People need to see Jesus in his church. That's what will change our world. So, Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you, Lord. I thank you because... Oh, my goodness, Lord. I've told people for years that every problem that they would ever face in this life, there is an answer in the Bible or it will be strongly implied throughout the Bible. There's no stone left unturned because you are the chief cornerstone, Lord. And so, if anything today, Lord, if I get anything away from this sermon today, because I've been aware of this for some time, I ought to be. I'm a, a man of God. 
I'm so thankful for what you've done, Jesus. I'm so thankful that I've found the way, the truth, and the life through you. I'm so thankful that you left us your precious word of God, our manual of operations in walking in this world. <clears throat> and so I pray, Lord, if we ever come in contact with an unbeliever that's kind of talking about all the inequality, we can witness to them and say, you know, if you want to listen to me, Jesus addressed just exactly what you were saying in his word. So we'll be able to shed light. But Lord, above all, help us to live the gospel, not just to speak the gospel. Let Jesus be seen in us. In your precious, wonderful name we pray, Lord. Amen. So the Lord bless you and keep you and help you model before the world the scripture of Jesus. You can't go wrong. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. God bless you today. Give the Lord a hand of offering. It's good. Amen.